Is Vern Gagne really a murderer? Violently threw the man onto the hard ground. Vern Gagne, sports legend, is connected to a death labeled a homicide. But is he a murderer? This is the story of how two very influential Minnesota men's lives tragically became intertwined in memories. If you were born before 1980 in the United States, then Vern Gagne probably needs no introduction. But the other man, noted chemist Helmut Gutmann, you may not have heard of before. Helmut was born in Germany in 1911. He fled the Nazi occupation and joined up with the U.S. military. He was captain in the U.S. Army's Chemical Warfare Service during World War II. And Helmut also had an illustrious post-war career, which we'll cover in a bit. For those of us born after 1980, this is Vern Gagne. He was one of the most famous technical wrestlers in the world, and probably your grandfather's favorite wrestler. He was my grandma's favorite wrestler. <laughs> in the mid-1900s, Vern Gagne was one of the United States' most recognized athletes. Born in Coracon, Minnesota, he was an accomplished high school wrestler for the Robbinsdale High School, and eventually was an NCAA champion college wrestler at the University of Minnesota. Between those two feats, he played football for the Gophers in 1943, enlisted in the Marines from 1944 to 1946, fighting in World War II, and then when he returned, he joined the University of Minnesota's wrestling team, where he became an NCAA champion. But he stayed friends with the football team, especially the post-war team, including Billy Bai. He had a short stint in the NFL on the Chicago Bears. He was the 145th draft pick of the year but never actually played a game because the coach made him choose between football or wrestling and wouldn't let him do both. He was also an alternate for the 1948 U.S. Olympic wrestling team. Finally, he decided to become a professional wrestler in 1949. Gagne's signature move is a sleeper hold. Basically, he gets behind someone, wraps his arm around their neck, and then uses his biceps and forearm to squeeze the blood vessels in their neck, which can cause them to pass out. Gagne wrestled for the AWA, which was mostly in the Great Lakes, Midwest part of the United States. Gagne was the world heavyweight champion of the AWA circuit 10 times during his long career, which spanned from 1949 until 1981, when he finally retired at almost 60 years of age. But Gagne is also most known from the all-star wrestling TV show he launched in 1960, produced, and regularly starred in. All-star! Wrestling. And while Gagne was busy with his wrestling career, Helmut Gutmann had a military career that led him to be the captain in the Chemical Warfare Service of the Army, before he eventually became a cancer research scientist at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Minneapolis. He spent 40 years in the latter role, and is listed as an author or co-author on at least 120 scientific journal articles. He was also a professor at the University of Minnesota. But on top of dedicating half of his life to cancer research, Gutmann was also a masterful classical musician and a deeply spiritual man. He played several instruments, but was a violinist on the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra for 12 years. Gutmann and his wife Betty also founded the Minnesota Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship Church in 1966 and he would sometimes play piano at the church services well into his 90s. And of course, while Gutmann was working in cancer research, Gagne was literally kicking ass and taking names. During this stint as a co-owner and one of the top billing wrestlers for the AWA, Gagne trained and launched the careers of some of the most famous wrestlers of his day and also some of the next generation, which were the biggest names when I was a kid like Shawn Michaels, Nature Boy Ric Flair, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, the Iron Sheik, Ken Patera, Animal, and Jesse Ventura. They all spent time at his demanding training camp that was held in a barn at his farm in Minnesota. I hope I'm not ruining anything by telling you that while wrestlers are athletes and their job is physically demanding, wrestling is basically a soap opera with a male target audience. And Gagne had made himself and also his organization really popular by doing three specific things. One, he focused mostly on one-act stories. Two, he emphasized and built his main storylines around technical wrestlers and mostly left the more powerhouse wrestlers to be foils or have B-rolls. And rarely, if ever, would they get a chance at a championship belt. And three, he was extremely rigid about his policies and decisions. And this eventually started to create problems for Gagne and the AWA in both business and personal matters. For instance, Gagne is the person who gave the bodybuilder Hulk Hogan his first real big break. In more ways than one, 
of the Hulkamania Society, I declare war! Kanye was always dismayed by the popularity of Hulkamania, because Hulk Hogan was a powerhouse and not a technical wrestler. So despite the fact that Hulk Hogan was the clear audience favorite, Kanye refused to give Hulk Hogan the heavyweight belt. And Kanye made a sweeping series of miscalculations about the Hulk. Know, Eventually, Vince McMahon offered Hulk the heavyweight belt and allowed him to be a main star. It, it's rumored that Kanye offered the Iron Sheik $100,000 to break Hulk Hogan's leg, but the Iron Sheik rejected that offer. The AWA was able to hang on for seven or eight more years after the Hulk left. However, the AWA basically became a training and testing ground for the talent that the WWF would recruit from and the movement of wrestlers was pretty massive. It was almost like a mutiny, as many people were more frustrated with Gagne and his repetitive storylines, nepotism, egoism, and his small-time vision of wrestling compared to what the WWF was doing on a national scale. And while AWA wrestlers were required as part of their contract to give AWA notice that they were leaving, many just left. It's rumored that Vince McMahon paid them more to skip out on their contracts early, and there are several wrestlers who say this in interviews, but McMahon denies that to this day. Eventually, the AWA folded in 1991, and Gagne settled into retirement. Helmet was about 10 years Gagne's senior, and had retired before the wrestler. Around 1999, Helmet and his wife Betty Gutman moved into a shared residence at Friendship Village, a retirement home with a location in Bloomington, Minnesota. And like the church founding Gutman, Gagne was known as a gracious, kind, and giving man. For instance, in 2007, Gagne went to a surprise birthday party for someone who considered Gagne a hero, Shane Sinclair, a 31-year-old man with Down syndrome who worked at Sam's Club. After eating cake, the two men went ice fishing. Gagne's friend Billy Bai said this was a common thing for Gagne. He said, Vern was a great man. It didn't make a difference to Vern whether you were Hubert Humphrey or a plumber. He'd shake your hand and make you feel good to be around him. Unfortunately, within a year or so of going ice fishing with Shane Sinclair, Gagne was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in his early 80s. As you probably know, Alzheimer's is a disease that heavily affects short-term memory, but sufferers often have vivid memories of the distant past in the early and middle stages of the disease before those memories fade as well. Saul DeLeo, one of Gagne's friends, said in hindsight that he noticed Gagne was having trouble with his short-term memory in the summer of 2007, but in hindsight, DeLeo thinks the wrestler's memory started slipping three or four years earlier. Sal says, If you look at Vern, he is still in very good shape. It just broke my heart to think his mind wasn't as strong. There is still the good Vern inside who remembers everything from 1946, 47, and 48, but has difficulty remembering what you told him 20 minutes ago. Bai says about this time, I know it sounds like I'm talking about someone who's gone, and I know I shouldn't do that. But because of this insidious disease, he's not our Vern. Our Vern was always larger than life, and by that I mean with his personality. It has been very tough to see him go through this because this is not the Vern I've known for most of my life. Sadly, a similar fate befell Helmut Gutmann around the same time, and he was diagnosed with a form of dementia in 2007. Though Helmut and his wife Betty had lived in Friendship Village since 1999, Helmet was moved to the memory loss section of the facility soon after his diagnosis. Within a year, Helmet and Gagne would be neighbors after Gagne moved into the memory loss ward. And as the men's condition worsened, Gagne and Helmet both had angry outbursts. Sometime in 2008 or 2009, Helmet began shouting at people in a recreation room at Friendship Village. Gagne puts a stop to this outburst by pushing Helmet before putting the older man in his signature move, a sleeper hold. While Helmet wasn't injured, this deeply frightened him. It's reported that Gagne had several physical altercations while living at the home, and some of the residents at Friendship Village said he had a history of aggressive outbursts. The true number of events is unknown, but there were at least two, including the one where he did his finishing move on Helmet. But otherwise, Helmet was still able to live a bit of a normal life. He attended church weekly at the Minnesota Valley Unitarian Universalist Church that he and his wife founded in 1966, and was even scheduled to perform a piano piece at a classical concert at the church in early February 2009. That is until January 26, 2009. In an open lobby of the facility near a nurse's station, there was another incident between the two men. It's unknown what caused it and what specifically happened because no one else was around and the two men involved promptly forgot what happened, but Helmet was slammed to the ground, which broke his hip and gave him a head injury. The rumored story around the case that was told to Betty Gutman and her daughter is that Gagne picked up Helmet and then violently threw him in onto the hard ground. It is speculated that this happened because he had a flashback to his wrestling days but the truth of that claim is impossible to verify. 
All we know for sure is that Helmet was shaken and thrown to the ground somehow. Betty was immediately notified after the vicious assault and rushed to the memory loss ward where she found Helmet in tremendous pain lying on the floor awaiting an ambulance. He was taken to the hospital where he went into surgery for his hip. Helmet's daughter, Ruth Hennig, said because of his dementia, her father didn't understand why his hip hurt because he had no memory of the fight with Gagne. He was released from the hospital a few days later with a good prognosis and seemed to be doing well, even with physical therapy for a week or so. But then he just stopped eating and drinking and died in hospice care a few days later on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2009. Ruth said that in his last days, we made sure we had Bach and Mozart CDs playing in the background, hoping that would give him some peace. Reflecting on her father in the incident, she says, At 97, he lived a really good life. He was, on the whole, healthy for most of it. But it was a shock and regrettable that his life came to an end in the way that it did. He was in pain, and he was extremely disoriented while he was in the hospital. Helmut's death was ruled a homicide by the Henpen County Medical Examiner, because Helmut died of complications from a right hip fracture after being pushed by Gagne to the floor. Homicide here is a medical term and doesn't have any legal or moral implications, as the medical examiner's job is solely to identify the cause of death and related medical matters like toxicology. In other words, homicide just means someone's death was caused either directly or indirectly by someone, even if through omission or mistake. Neither family is particularly surprised by the ruling. Ruth Henning said, I know Vern Gagne was either indirectly or otherwise responsible for my father's death. My father would be alive today if Vern Gagne had not lifted him off the floor and thrown him down. It doesn't mean that I blame Vern Gagne. He had Alzheimer's, so I don't think you can actually hold him responsible for what he did. The men's fight was investigated by the Bloomington Police Department. But 83-year-old Vern Gagne was cleared of all the charges because a man with a minute-long memory who attacked another man who also can't remember the attack is a pretty clear example of someone who is not mentally able to stand trial because he cannot truly understand the proceedings or actually offer a defense. Former prosecutor Joseph Daly said about this case that, It's a tragedy for the man who was killed. It's a tragedy for the man's family. But it's equally a tragedy for the family of Vern Gagne. Helmut Gutmann's family did not wish to press charges because the family wanted to follow Betty Gutmann's wishes. Betty couldn't really blame Gagne because he had Alzheimer's. Most people with Alzheimer's don't really hurt others when they lash out because they're old and frail. But in Gagne's case, Betty said, he was a professional athlete and was trained to do certain moves. This is what makes him much more dangerous than the ordinary person with dementia. Ruth Henning said, I don't blame him in the sense that I know he's not fully responsible for what he did. But on the other hand, I know that my father would still be alive today if they hadn't had this altercation. I'm more sad than angry. And later, she emails a reporter this message. I do think that the coroner's homicide finding raises concerning questions about the precautions that nursing facilities need to take in caring for patients with Alzheimer's. It's hard enough for people and families who are affected with Alzheimer's. They shouldn't have to worry about physical vulnerabilities or the risk of harm. It's been so hard on both families, said Gagne's son, Greg. Reflecting on this tragic last period of his friend Vern Gagne's life, Billy Bai says, He's one of the nicest people in the world. He did so many things for people, whether it was a charity event or a small kindness for an individual having a problem, that whatever happened, this was not the real Vern. In other words, despite being the cause of events that led to Helmut's death, almost no one thinks that Gagne is a murderer. After this incident, Gagne moved in with his daughter where he lived until he died on April 27th, 2015. What do you think of this case? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're ready for another case, check out this one about another professional fighter accused of murder who also says he doesn't understand what happened. But spoiler alert, he did! And if you've seen that one, check out this one that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy.